If you will, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, as you're turning there, let me uh, mention, uh, you'll see that this evening I'm going to preach on a, a number of things that the Bible discusses as to reasons why we gather. I had somebody recently, just in a general conversation, ask a question about uh, why we gather, and I hadn't spoken on that for a little while, so I thought we'll go back and look at that into, in some great detail. Uh, if you will, go ahead and turn to Acts 18, 24 through 28. We're going to look at uh, excuses regarding confrontation. And the reason I, I actually chose this, there's a number of reasons, but the things I'm going to discuss today are things that I know have personally, um, I've been responsible of, I think, in my life at some point as a Christian in not dealing with something that's, that's come to light. Uh, or I've seen it take place somewhere else. And some of the things we're going to look at are still things that pop up today that I know that we as Christians, we might see something taking place and we wonder to ourselves, is that something that I need to talk with that person about? Uh, is that something that I need to get involved in? And so I thought we'd look this morning uh, at excuses regarding confrontation. Well, go ahead and turn with, with me, Acts 18. We're just going to look at a, f a few verses here. You guys are very familiar with this passage. I think many of us have, uh, have studied through this. So follow along with me as we learn about Apollos here. Again, Acts 18, verses 24 through 28. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ." I think all of us as Christians understand that we live in a time when men's souls are in danger. And it wasn't any different in the first century. You go back and you think about the fact that people are dying all around us. Even worse, people in sin are dying around us. And as a Christian, this really ought to cause us some serious concern. I want you to notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 11. I'll continue to go back to Acts 18 as we look through here. But in 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 11, Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience." What does Paul mean here when he talks about knowing the terror of the Lord? Well, it goes back to just what I started off with in this sermon. We understand souls are in danger. We know that we have friends whose souls are in danger. We know that we have maybe fellow Christians uh, who are not living faithful according to the Word. Their souls are in danger. We have co-workers whose souls are in danger. People that we come into contact on a regular basis. And because of that, we need to persuade men. Just like Paul says here, we know that Paul persuaded men, and so must we. But we also have to acknowledge that sometimes we don't want to persuade men. And there's a number of reasons why somebody may not want to persuade men or to confront men. I think oftentimes, and, and we know it's true and it's getting worse, our society today is severely overburdened with an oversensitivity, oversensitivity to uh, being told things they don't like. Uh, so much so that, that people oftentimes are labeled. And I won't go into all the different labels that they may give to you, but they may, they may call you biased or they'll call you prejudiced or maybe a homophobe. Or, or the list would, would continue on, and there's a number of things that people might call you. And so, because many people realize there's an oversensitivity to correction or to saying something that others find offensive, oftentimes people refuse to confront somebody. Oftentimes, they'll try to find a different way, uh, or they'll find it no way at all. And sometimes it's because they don't want to be labeled. Now, certainly, we understand that there are times when we need to be very careful with our words 
and consider what it is that we're, we're saying. But there are certainly times when we have to speak up. Because as we've just noticed here in 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 11, we know that there are, there are people who are dying. Now, when we look here in Acts uh, 18, we read of Apollos. And it's an interesting account because Apollos here, he is, he's teaching. And I began to think to myself, I wonder how many people, if they were there and they'd heard what Apollos was teaching, I wonder how many people would actually stand up and say something to Apollos. The reason I, I was primarily thinking about this is as we study along in the book of 1 Corinthians right now, how many of you guys have wondered to yourself? We're in the fourth chapter now. How many of you have you wondered to yourself, how did the Corinthian church get to the point that they're at so that Paul had to write, Paul had to, write to them? I've asked myself a number of times as we've been reading through Corinthians, how come somebody hadn't dealt with this yet? Did you guys realize that oftentimes it's uncomfortable to deal with people who are in error? And there's a number of reasons why. Sometimes they're friends. Sometimes they're, they're, they're family. There's a number of reasons. And, and as I started off this sermon, I've been guilty, I think, a few, a few of these, if not all of them. And I still see them raising their head from time to time. So let's go through and look at a number of reasons why somebody may step back and say, I don't believe that I want to either get involved or I don't want to confront the issue. Let's give a few of the reasons. Sometimes you have people who, as they teach and as they speak, they are very eloquent. What I mean is, is they're very convincing in what it is that they say. I would go so far as to say a lot of the people you see on TV today teaching religious things uh, would be described better oftentimes as professional uh, speakers than as to theologians or whatever it is you might want to call them, right? They're very polished. They're very, very uh, uh, pronounced in what it is that they say. But Apollos was too. Notice in Acts 18, 24, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born, born at Alexandria, notice this, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. So you've got this gentleman here who, who's speaking and teaching on religious things. He's described as being eloquent and mighty in the scriptures. I guess I could phrase it like this. He probably sounded like he knew what he was talking about. Again, very polished. Now, here's the thing. There are some who will look at the intelligence of a man or the way that he speaks, maybe the way that he dresses, and because he speaks like, uh, especially regarding religious things, because he speaks like he, he just knows it, and because he's very eloquent, there are others who they would hear something, their ears perk up, and they, they know it's not right. But in their mind, they begin to second-guess themselves, or they assume, well, because he's so eloquent and because he's been such trained, he must be right. I think I've seen that there are a number of times where people, I think, are afraid to correct or address an issue because it was said by a preacher or because it was said by an elder or because maybe they're newer in the faith, and yet this person's been a Christian for a number of years. And I could give a number of, of other examples but they hear that person and they think he's been a Christian longer or he speaks so eloquent, certainly he must be right. How many of you guys have ever had that happen? I've had it happen. I heard something and my ears perked up and I went, no, no wait a minute, I, I don't think that's right. And then I thought to myself, but he's been a Christian for so long and it, it seems so eloquent. Just because somebody's eloquent doesn't mean that they're right. And yet, we realize that sometimes that's how error begins to creep into a congregation, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. There are many who are very convincing when they teach erroneous doctrine. Their arguments oftentimes are well organized. They oftentimes seem very logical. And another thing that they'll do is they'll oftentimes they'll skip over to books that are very hard to understand. They'll go to passages maybe from Ezekiel or Daniel or the book of Revelation, and they'll take a passage that is a very difficult passage, and they'll explain it in such a way that wrongly. They'll explain it in such a way that it just seems like it's right. I'm thinking of a couple guys on TV that I watch occasionally who are diehard premillennial teachers, and they'll explain a doctrine, and I know it's wrong, and I'll literally laugh to myself and say, that guy, if I didn't know any better, I mean, I'd believe what he's saying, because he's very eloquent. He's convincing, and I know that for a fact there have been times when I've heard something, and I thought to myself, I don't think that's right. But he seems so eloquent and he seems so sincere. 
You know, oftentimes we're, talk, we're warned and, uh, about the wisdom of man. I want you to listen to 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I think Paul makes it very clear that his whole point in preaching the gospel was to try to overcome this wisdom of man, whether it's in religious matters or whatever it might be. We need to understand that just because somebody's eloquent and just because he's, he's teaching on something doesn't mean that he's right. And I, again, I think most of us at some point have fallen for this. And, and that's why Timothy was simply told to preach the word. You go back and you listen to 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And he goes on and he tells them why. There's going to come a time when people are going to depart from the faith. And so we understand why we, we refrain from matters of, of opinion or matters of conjecture. What I mean by that is things that the Bible really doesn't give me the information on. We just stick to the word, right? Very simple. But I need to tell you, because I've, I've fallen prey to it, and you probably have too, that sometimes people are going to sound convincing. They're going to, they're going to be very eloquent. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't question or confront when we hear it. How about this one? Well, I heard what he said, but he was only wrong on that one point. Only wrong on the one point. I began to think a little bit about that. Let's, let's go back to Acts 18.25 as we look at Apollos here, the example. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Let's pause for a minute. That's pretty good, right? So far. Notice there's a comma. Knowing only the baptism of John. How many today, when they consider what somebody's preaching and teaching, will dismiss that one thing? What I mean is, is they heard a sermon, and the sermon was amazing. And the sermon was very accurate, except for the one thing, whatever that one thing was. Here we've got this issue with Apollos, who's teaching. Now, while we certainly realize there are things that we can differ on, I'm talking about matters of, of liberty, there are certain things that we don't have to agree on. They're not matters of the faith. But we also understand that there are things that are matters of the faith. And we also understand that it only takes one thing to be totally wrong. I mean, if, if just one thing was a small deal, why did they even have to deal with Apollos in the first place, right? In Galatians 1, 6-7, notice what we find here. Paul writes this, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Let me pause for a minute. Anytime somebody begins to teach erroneous um, Matters of faith. Let's we'll phrase it that way. Matters of faith. Erroneous matters of faith. Anytime somebody begins to do that, they're teaching another gospel. Anytime you begin to teach that this is a matter of salvation and that's a matter of salvation, you begin to teach things that are not accurate, you're starting to teach another gospel. Now, Paul clears it up. He says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There are people who are, who are intermingling things that are not accurate in with that which is accurate. So they could be teaching a lot of stuff that's right, but then they're adding stuff that is not. And we know that if somebody's teaching error, that it's got to be addressed. Okay? If we begin to ignore it, it becomes very dangerous. Listen to 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little leaven's the same as a little error, right? In both cases, it does great damage. I began to think about this as we talk about that mindset of, well, almost everything was correct, but there's just this one area that he was wrong. There's just this one issue that he's wrong on or this, this one area where he falls short. I began to think about the rich young ruler. You guys remember what Jesus told the rich young ruler? He said, yet lackest thou one thing, Luke 18, 22. Now, oftentimes, many people think that one thing is not a big deal. Here's what we learn from Jesus. Jesus declares even that one thing needs to be addressed. And we see that taking place here in the account with Apollos. 
It was just that one thing, right? He was actually mighty in the scriptures. But they had to come back and deal with that one thing. And so we have this understanding that sometimes somebody's going to be eloquent. It doesn't mean that they're always right. Sometimes you're going to have somebody who is teaching the majority of correct doctrine, but they're off in one thing. In both those situations, we've got to deal with it. How many of you guys have ever seen this? Somebody is, is teaching something, and they're, they're teaching something that's not right. They're off, and basically the response is, well, I don't want to, I don't want to kill his enthusiasm. You oftentimes will see this, especially with a new Christian. I think I've seen this more with a new Christian than I have with anybody else. Here, Acts 18.25, we've got Apollos. He's described as being fervent in the Spirit. He was zealous, right? He was enthusiastic. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that Apollos was very zealous and enthusiastic in his teaching. And I would go so far as to say that enthusiasm and zeal is something that we all need to have, right? It's something that's important. But zeal doesn't take preference over knowledge. How many of you guys have ever talked with somebody who was zealous, they were enthusiastic, and yet they were just completely wrong? We know logically enthusiasm is no more important than having understanding. Think about this. If, if you think that route, I mean, we understand that Paul was extremely enthusiastic and zealous in persecuting the Christians, right? He was wrong. He would made a mistake. Go back and look at Acts 26, 11 or uh, Philippians 3, 6. Zeal simply shows how how excited we are about something, right? Enthusiasm. But you could be very excited and be completely wrong. Uh, there's a number of groups that will go around. They'll knock on your door, and they will study with you. You've probably had a few of them come to your house. They are enthusiastic about what it is that they're teaching. They're excited about it. They have a lot of zeal. And oftentimes, they're, they're wrong. I began to think about this. Have you guys ever known somebody who was so, so zealous that they would even do something like maybe lie in order to get their way. I've seen that take place before. Uh, you would hope something like that wouldn't happen with a Christian, but I've seen things like that. And then you have others who out of a fear of, enthousi of, of crushing this person's enthusiasm, they'll just ignore whatever it is erroneous being taught so that they don't kill that person's enthusiasm. Well, certainly we understand we can't do that. Uh, if somebody's in error, then we understand it's our responsibility to go back and try to correct that error so that we can save their soul. But there are a number of reasons why people uh, don't want to confront error. It's interesting, though, as we look here at this account with Apollos. Now, Apollos was teaching error. Apollos, we know, was corrected of this error. And then we find that he went out and he mightily refuted the Jews publicly, right? Right? Uh, the reason I thought about that was after Aquila and Priscilla pulled him to the side, we don't read about Apollos being mad and angry at the fact that they pulled him and corrected him. You know what he actually did with that enthusiasm? He took the enthusiasm and the zeal that he had, he combined it with the new knowledge that he had, and he went out and he mightily preached the gospel. How many of you guys ever had somebody correct you? Just raise your hand. I, I have. You know what we're supposed to do? We take that new knowledge, we continue with the zeal that we had, we mix the two, and we continue to go out and try to grow the kingdom. That's what Apollos did here. But you have some who won't confront somebody because they don't want to ruin that person's enthusiasm. It's not very logical, but it is something that happens. Sometimes you've got the mindset of this. Well, I know that he's teaching something that's erroneous, but I don't really think that what he's teaching is going to really hurt anybody. I've seen that before. I think I've even fallen for that before. If we begin to think like this, that's a pretty big mistake. Let me explain it this way. You don't know what damage somebody will do, even if what they're teaching is off in just a little bit. And let me explain it this way, because as I began to think about this as I was preparing this sermon, every single bit of error known in the religious world today began with one person. Did you ever think about that? Premillennialism started with one person. Calvinism started with one person. The Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine, guess who that started with? One person. Mormonism started with one person. You go back to any religious error out there, it began with one person. That mindset of, you know, I know what he's teaching is wrong is not going to hurt anybody, is shown to be false in the fact that everything out there that's erroneous began with one person. We need to see the danger for what it is. I want you to consider, because we see Apollos, and Apollos is teaching, they go back and they correct him, but just after this, and I find it, I find it intriguing, that Paul 
he goes over to uh, Ephesus. Apollos, he's, he's gone on his way to Corinth now, uh, having learned the truth and teaching accurately. But it's interesting that Paul shows up in Ephesus, and what do you got there in Ephesus? You've got people who had learned only the baptism of John, which incidentally is what we just found out Apollos was out teaching. Was it Apollos that taught him that? The Bible doesn't actually say. It'd be a good guess on my part, but I don't know for sure. But I know that what they believed is what Apollos was teaching, right? And again, anytime error comes from somewhere, we know that it all began with one person. Regardless of where it came from, though, Paul had to address it. And he did. He dealt with the problem there. There are far too many people who either want to sweep the air under the rug or they really want to keep themselves away from it, sometimes even because they just, in their own mind, they've justified it. It's, it's just small air. Think about that. Do those two words even really go together? <laughs> I began to think about a couple of congregations. You remember the church there in Pergamos who had tolerated the false teaching uh, of Balaam and others there in Thyatira uh, or in Pergamos. And then as I thought about Thyatira, you remember what they had going on? They had a woman there by the name of Jezebel. And Jezebel, they permitted her. She came in and she not only taught, but she was seducing the saints. Why do I bring those up? Well, you've got, a, you've got air in, going on there in those congregations. You go back to the verse we just looked at, talking about a little bit of leaven, leaven at the whole lump. It all starts with, as, and I don't like these words again, but it all starts with just a little bit, right? A little bit grows very quickly. We've seen probably somewhere in our life where error has crept into the church. As a matter of fact, I would say that most of us could actually begin to name erroneous doctrine that you find taught in congregations. I won't go through and mention a bunch of them because we could, but let's just, we'll just use one. How about the, how about the 80-70 doctrine? Right? Error just creeps into a congregation. I use that one because historically... Uh, at another congregation where I was at, we had a gentleman who showed up. He announced it. He believed this, but he promised to keep it to himself. Uh, and you guys know what happened without me even telling you. He didn't keep it to himself. He began to kind of sneak in around the people and teach a little bit here and teach a little bit there. The idea, if you can teach enough of it slowly and quietly, eventually it can creep in and take hold, right? That's how error takes over. That's how it always takes over. And so we have to take steps not to let it happen. Now, as I thought about that, this isn't just uh, the responsibility of the individuals. Oftentimes in a congregation, you have elders. That's one of their responsibilities. Let me read you a passage, Titus 1, 9 through 11. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. In congregations where you have elders, that's one of the responsibilities is for the, is for the elders to go back and to try to stop this teaching that's going to come into the congregation and hurt people, right? But it's not just elders of the congregation. We understand as individuals we have a responsibility to ourselves and to everyone else. Let me read the Ephesians 5, 6, 2, 7, and I'll move on to the next one. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Let me pause for a minute. For that to happen, we need to know the Word of God, right? Very simply, we need to study and have an understanding. For because of these things cometh the wrath, the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. I have to have an understanding of what it is that he's teaching so that, one, I can keep myself from being carried away into it and that I can help others. So far, here's what we've noticed. There's sometimes those who will not confront error because a person's very eloquent. They just seem like they know what they're talking about. You've got some who uh, will look at the person and say, well, he's, he's correct on the majority of stuff. He's just wrong on this one thing. Then you have others, as we've just noticed, they don't want to kill somebody's enthusiasm. And, and some will say, well... I don't think his teaching that he's teaching on here is going to hurt anybody. How about another one? Well, the guy is so sincere. I've oftentimes talked with people who, who were extremely wrong, but they were very sincere. When we look here at the account of Apollos, I don't think anybody here would question his sincerity, right? 
Uh, but just we've already looked at zeal. Just like zeal is not enough, just sincerity is not enough. We know it's important, though. Let me give you two passages. Listen to Philippians 1, 9 through 10. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Notice 1 Peter 1.22. Now this word actually is translated a little differently, but it means sincere. 1 Peter 1.22. Seeing ye have purified yourselves in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. That word unfeigned there is sincere. Sincere love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Okay, so we understand sincerity is necessary as a part of the Christian faith. But we also understand sincerity in and of itself can't save anybody, right? And we certainly can't use it as an excuse to dismiss erroneous ideas and teaching or, or dealing with somebody. We know that Paul was extremely uh, zealous. We know that he was also very sincere. Acts 23.1 says he had lived in all good conscience. That's because he was very sincere in what he did. You go back and you look at Acts 26.9. He thought he must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Why? He sincerely believed that uh, persecuting the Christians was in alignment with his Jewish faith. Here's the point. Paul was very sincere. We have many today who claim to be followers of Christ who are very sincere. Many of them are our family members. They are our very close friends, again, co-workers. Uh, we'll find them in, in a number of areas in our life. Uh, you've even got those who will try to use this idea of sincerity as the basis for fellowship. That's becoming more and more prominent. Congregations, they're more worried about being sincere or being loving than they are maybe on points of doctrine. And so you've got some that would say, well, I don't really want to confront that because the guy's very sincere about it. it to be honest, it goes back up with the next point. I don't think that's going to really hurt anybody. Let me, before I go on to the next point, and this is really the, uh, the, big, the big one, I think. Most of these things that we're talking about, I think most of us would say at some point, I've had that happen. I've had somebody say something, I knew it wasn't right, but I wasn't comfortable in addressing it. And there's a number of reasons why. He seemed like he knew what he was talking about, and so I, I had self-doubt. There's a whole bunch of reasons, but I think a lot of it boils down to this last one right here. I don't want to lose him as a friend or I don't want to lose him as a family member, or whatever it is that this very close relationship is. How many people today, if they were here and they heard Apollos preaching what it was that he, brought, he, he, he was teaching there, how many wouldn't address him if he was their friend? And they weren't quite sure how he was going to respond. And I know for a fact almost every one of us here has had this happen, whether it was a family member, whether it was a friend, whatever it was. There are those who will value a friendship with somebody, or they'll value their family relationship with somebody. Let's say a, a brother-sister relationship, or a brother-brother, or, or a child-parent relationship. They value the relationship so much that they say to themselves, I don't, I don't really think I want to deal with that. Right? And I, I would go so far as to say most of us have had this happen to us. I've had it happen to myself. There have been times where I've, hear, I've heard somebody say something and I thought, should I deal with that now, or do I just kind of add it to the list of things that I need to address at some point? Well, there are many who, they just don't want to jeopardize the relationship that they have, and so they'll let something go by. And here's the problem that no matter how good somebody is in the world's standards, no matter how good we are or how good somebody is by their own standards or even by our own standards, if they're living in and teaching error, they're going to be lost until they change. Let me summarize that. A lot of us have good moral friends and family members who are, are carried off uh, by a number of erroneous doctrines. And it's good that they're decent people, and hopefully that would help us in, in getting to reach the lost. But I think back to Hebrews 10.31 when we find the Hebrews writer saying, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it certainly it is when somebody doesn't understand that they're not living righteously. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.11, again, and we, we notice this. He says, because of the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Let, let me make it a little more personal. For those of us who have family members who are not Christians, 
I want you to think for just a second about the terror of the Lord, whether it's a brother, whether it's a sister, whether it's a very close friend. Would you rather them be a little upset with you now or maybe even risk whatever that relationship is so that they don't have to face the final judgment and see the wrath of God? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the Bible makes it very clear. If you go back and you look at Mark 10, 29, if you're a Christian, you better be willing to forsake your home. You better be willing to forsake brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers for the name of Christ. And that means if you've got somebody who is teaching error, and even though you may lose them as a friend, and even though you may lose them as a family member, you need to be willing to risk that. And you think about Aquila and Priscilla. Now, I don't know how well they knew Apollos. I know he's described as an eloquent man. I know that he's described as one who was mighty in the Scriptures. But look what we read in Acts 18.26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Aquila and Priscilla are hearing him, right? And it says, Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them. Now, I love how the King James renders this. <laughs> Notice that. And they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They set him straight is what they did. I don't know exactly to what extent and how they did it, but they did it. Why? They didn't want him to go around and teach any more error, plus they were, they were thinking of his own soul. We as Christians need to consider that when we know somebody who's involved in error or teaching error. Not only for themselves, but for the people that they're teaching. You guys realize that error spreads exponentially. The same as adding to the kingdom spreads exponentially. Think about it this way. You make a Christian, they teach someone, and that person teaches someone. You've got exponential growth, right? Think about it. Think about it with air. Let's again use the false lie, the doctrine of 8070. They teach someone the 8070 doctrine. They teach someone. They teach someone. It's exponential growth. Do you want exponential growth for air or for truth? That's how we need to look at it. We are given extremely specific instructions. I'll give you just a couple of passages. We're given a couple of very specific instructions about how we deal with brethren in error. Oftentimes people wonder, how do you deal with someone who has begun to either veer off or they've left completely? James, I think, summarizes it. Go to James 5, 19 through 20. And if this isn't something you've ever noticed before, it ought to change your mindset on how you deal with an erring Christian. <clears throat> brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let me pause for a minute. You know how somebody becomes a Christian? Somebody converts him. You know what you do to a Christian who's left the faith and is no longer faithful? You reconvert them. That's what we find here in James 5.19. How'd you convert the guy in the first time? I bet you had to set up a Bible study, didn't you? Some serious study. How do you convert a guy that's gone into error? You're going to have to set up another Bible study and do some serious study. But look what happens when, ha when you do that. Verse 20. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. That's the whole basis behind why we would want to confront or address somebody teaching any type of erroneous doctrine, whether it's a brother or a sister or one of my best friends, right? That's the reason behind it. Listen to Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, notice here now, they don't use the word convert, they use a different word, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. He was in a position of righteousness at one time, but he left that. So you as a Christian, James 5.19, you need to reconvert him. And if you reconvert him, you'll restore him to the fellowship that he once had with the Father, right? And he goes on, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Think of it this way. You could be the one who got drawn away into error. You need to love that brother so much in the same way that you would hope someone would love you and come and try to restore you back. He then says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let me give you one more passage here as we talk about how to deal with somebody. Now this passage that I'm going to give you is specifically dealing with when somebody has sinned against you, when someone has an ought against you. But oftentimes what we find is, is this is often uh, the best way to deal with a matter, okay? Uh, when somebody's teaching error. <clears throat> it's oftentimes best if you know them well, just sit down. Notice Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained 
thy brother. Sometimes that's the best way to deal with it. Sometimes that's not the best way. Sometimes it has to be publicly done. And it's going to depend on the situation. But oftentimes, if somebody believes something that's erroneous and they really do need to be confronted, oftentimes the best way is to just sit down with someone to let them know in a very loving way <clears throat> that, th that there's some things that they, they believe that are inaccurate. But certainly we're not doing anybody any favors when we are willing to uh, not confront error or when we're not willing to sit down and, and to show somebody where they may be wrong. We've got to be reminded of our need to go out and to try to preach and to teach the gospel, to try to add people to the kingdom. And we have to remember, I think, the same way we started is the same way that we should end. We have people dying around us all the time. People out in the religious world who are dying in sin. Brothers and sisters in Christ who are dying in sin. And sometimes the reason they die in sin is because we're too scared to confront them. Sometimes we, we just don't feel that we have enough knowledge. And again, there's a number of reasons. He seemed very eloquent. It, it didn't seem like at the time it was going to do any damage. Let me say this. I've heard of a number of congregations where something happened and their initial thought was, I don't really think that's going to cause a problem. And later what you find out is it caused serious damage. So as I draw this to a close, and this time I actually am going to draw it to a close. I know sometimes I say that and go 20 more minutes. I'm not going to this time. As I draw this to a close, ask yourself during this holiday season, the people that you're going to come into contact with, family members, friends, those that you know who are either lost in the world or maybe even unfaithful Christians now, what can you do to try to draw them back? What can you do to try to help them by confronting whatever it is that they uh, may falsely believe? And, and certainly with that being said, one of the biggest things we come into contact with is those who have a misunderstanding with what the church is uh, and how to become a Christian. So very quickly, we understand that as you look at the New Testament, it's not a complicated process. You find there were people simply teaching the gospel. Primarily it was the in the recorded accounts, the apostles who were going around, but we have others called evangelists or ministers, and they were preaching the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And there were people who believed it, John 8, 24, Hebrews eleven six. 6. We have this understanding that we must believe that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God. And when those people believed that He was the Son of God, they were willing to repent of their sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5, uh, because they had an understanding of the consequence of sin. They also were willing to not only repent of their sins, but to con Confess Christ as the Messiah. Go look at Romans 10, 9 and 10. I hope that's not angels' wings I hear in the background. Did I just say that lie? Part of the invitation. So not only were they hearing the Word of God, not only did they believe the Word of God, not only were they willing to repent of their sins and confess the name of Christ, they were willing to be immersed in water for the remission of their sins, Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16. 16. Jesus made it so simple, you have to try to mess it up. You go back and look, Mark 16.16. 16. Jesus said, uh, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That word there actually, aposteo, he who disbelieves, disobeys. You can't get any simpler than that. Because when you are willing to obey the gospel and to be immersed in water, you're added to the church by the Lord Himself, Acts 2, verse 47. That's not what the religious world around us primarily teaches. But they need to be confronted when they teach something else. Because that's the loving thing to do. If you're here and, and there's a way that we can help you spiritually, whether we can pray for you, uh, whether you need someone to sit down and study with you, or if there's some other way we could help you or assist you, or even if you want to be added to the church this very hour, you can do that. But in either situation, if you need the assistance of this congregation, you can come forward as we stand and we sing a song of invitation.